Welcome back. So uh, you would have uh, presumably, hopefully, uh, just finished uh, watching the uh, six-part documentary produced by the BBC, uh, Tales in the Jungle. And so um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sorry that the quality is, is not that great. Uh, in a time when we are getting used to 4K and even 5K, then it is a bit a bit difficult and a bit unpleasant to be watching such slow, low resolution video. So um, in the last lecture, I made a couple of comments about where Malinowski and his methods fit in with the mm, with the European, the British and the American schools of anthropology. And the significance of this is going to be uh, shown uh, when we talk about Margaret Mead, who was an American cultural anthropologist, the student of uh, Franz Boas, and um, she um, disagreed in a number of ways with Derek Freeman, who was trained in the British school. But enough about those guys. Let's get back to Malinowski. So, uh, one of the, the, the video, the documentary that you've just watched, done in six parts, and some, some of the content of some of the parts weren't so relevant uh, to the subject of research methods, but it helps us get a bit of an understanding of the wider story, um, the wider picture of how Malinowski made the discoveries and the methodological contributions that he did. There were a number of points made, and one of them was the phenomenon of Victorian armchair anthropology. So what were the characteristics of this? Well, one of them was that these were um, often um, conducted as expeditions, um, a large number of these uh, these foreigners, Europeans, would travel to different parts of the world which had, um, as was often the case at the time, relatively recently been colonised and they would be part of the colonial system and they would travel by ship and they would come with lots of equipment and anthropologists would be people who would be working along zoologists and botanists and they would travel through in these expeditions and they would uh, collect uh, samples of plant life and they would record uh, the animals that they encountered and they would collect the objects, they would be collecting objects. So they were interested in this um, thing called materiality which is stuff, which is concrete things that tell us, it almost always tell us quite a lot about the, um, the culture, uh, the religious beliefs, the social structures that exist at the time. And armchair, armchair, um, armchair anthropologists, they relied on accounts written not by themselves, although some went on these expeditions, they relied quite extensively on the accounts of, um, of native cultures, for want of a better word, in parts of Africa, Asia, South America, the Pacific, that had been written by missionaries, by colonial officials, and by travellers. And so there was an extensive emphasis, and I would add an unhelpful and potentially dangerous emphasis, on secondary data, not primary data. And we'll talk more about the, those concepts later on. So, what are some examples? What are some examples of um, this phenomenon of expeditions? 
um, in Thailand. Now, as someone who's lived and worked in South Thailand, um, I would rather share with you my expertise about South Thailand than try and um, pretend that I know um, everything about everything in every part of the country. I don't know everything about um, everything that every anthropologist has written about Thailand's fascinating cultural diversity. But there is a very interesting, a number of very interesting accounts produced by some British anthropologists that travelled through South Thailand in the late 19th century in a classic um, form of Victorian anthropology supported by British colonial um, uh, administrations in Malaysia, which was then British Malaya. And these people travelled, they had a team of botanists, of zoologists, as well as um, anthropologists, uh, the most important member of which was a man called Skeet. And if you have any, if you've had any um, interest in um, studies of uh, Malay society, you would know the word um, Skeet and someone who came after him, Wilkinson. And so one of the members of the expedition was a guy called uh, Annandale, and he wrote a, a two-volume uh, book on the findings, there was stuff on botany, on zoology, but there was also interesting material produced um, by him on musical instruments um, and things used in, in magic. There was uh, descriptions of rituals that they happened to encounter as they were traveling through, as was the custom at the time. Um, these anthropologists, these British anthropologists who were two or three decades, well, at least two decades before Malinowski and his contributions, they were obsessed with things that Europeans were obsessed with, which was mentioned in the documentary, and that was about things such as the skull size of, of the savages, of the natives, and so you will... Um, Perhaps, like me, you read chapters like this, the construction of the physical anthropology of the, Mal of the Malay Peninsula, you will be very surprised to see descriptions of the size of people's pelvises and the size of their heads, uh, a remarkable thing. Uh, we think it's remarkable now looking back. So what were some of the main mythological uh, contributions of, of Malinowski who moved away from Victorian armchair anthropology which often emphasised secondary data written by others, missionaries, colonial officials and travellers which uh, were sometimes produced during expeditions and what is the problem with expeditions? Well. You are on the move. You would move into a village with this big entourage. These guys traveled on elephants. They traveled um, on ox cart. They had a big team of people who were porters. They had cooks. They had tents. Um, they had a large number of people. They were on the move. And so whenever they encountered something, their description of what they encountered was anecdotal. It was what they happened to see at the time that they were passing through. And when they passed through, they had an enormous presence in, at this time in South Thailand and in northern, Mal in northern Malaya as it was then. There were relatively few Europeans traveling through. And you can imagine about how people um, may have avoided uh, strangers like this, or may have wanted to uh, get in front of them for the wrong reasons. So one of the points made in the documentary about Malinowski is there was high prejudice in the works published by armchair anthropologists 
and there was low scientific rigor that things need to be more scientific. There needs to be greater and more diverse forms of scientific methods and vigor. He turned him. He was. He was a. He was a, a, a man with a personality who was rather obsessive, very focused, and very detailed. And this is an important point, and I want to dovetail this with my own summary of my own research journey, because all of us, you see, uh, possess very, very different personal strengths. And uh, there is a saying which um, I have lived and worked by um, for a number of years now, and it is that it is best to make decisions on who you are rather than who you wish you were. And so we can. One of the reasons that Malinowski was able to be such a detailed observer is that he himself possessed a very obsessive and detailed personality. Um, um, let's go on to the next point. And this is an important point. When I gave you my own reflection, my own introduction on how I stumbled into anthropology, about how I became an accidental anthropologist, I talked about how I had turned up as an English teacher with my family in South Thailand in 2000. And I lived in a community, I rented a house, it was a cheap house, we didn't have a lot of money, I rented a cheap house in a community, I went to work, I had a child, so I looked after her in the morning, I went to coffee shops, that's where I learned language, that's where I heard about people talking. And um, all of this happened by accident. In the same way, Malinowski, when he originally left at the behest, following the instructions of his supervisors, he was told, I want you to go away for a year and I want you to do an expedition because this is the way, this was the main research method used by anthropologists at the time. And where did he go? He went to Australia. And having gone to Australia, he went on to what was then a colony of Australia, uh, Papua New Guinea. Now what happened uh, when he was in Papua New Guinea? Why is it that he stayed for more than a year? He was told to go for a year, but he ended up by staying for more than a year. He, did he stay for more than a year because he had planned to do so? The answer is, of course, no. He did not plan to be there for so long. And why was this? Because the First World War happened. How did this affect someone who was Polish? Because as someone who was Polish, uh, the Poles were not aligned with, um, with Britain and her allies, most importantly France, they were aligned uh, with, uh, with Germany. And so if Malinowski had left Papua New Guinea, he would have to have travelled. There was no Air Asia at the time. There was no Thai Lion Air at the time. So he would have had to have travelled by ship, and what would have been his route to return back home? He would have gone through Australia. Australia was an ally of, was a colony of um, Britain, and because of that, if a German or a Pole had turned up in Australia, had turned up in customs, he immediately would have been arrested, and he would have been probably taken to an internship camp where he would have had to have spent the rest of the First World War. Now this is something that he didn't want to do, but all of this happened by accident. Before we can, we can assume that before he turned up, we may surmise that either before he turned up 
or while he was spending time doing what we would now refer to as field work in this part of the island part of Papua New Guinea, he would have read what had already been written by entre anthropologists, by travellers, by missionaries and by colonial officials about the cultural and social distinctives of this part of what we now call Papua New Guinea. And Malinowski, because he was now staying there longer unexpectedly, he began to observe important differences. This led him to, um, partly because of the First World War, this led him to shift into a village. He began to learn the local language and, um, and he began to uh, integrate into um, the everyday life. And this, these, experience, these experiences of staying there longer, two, three years. The experience of taking the time because he's not passing through in some expedition. He's in one place. He's in one place for a long time. He is able to learn a local language and he is able to see what people are doing. He is able to participate um, in the everyday life about what people are doing. And so in previous lectures, I've said this, that we do participant observation alongside interviews because people don't say what they do and people, not all, but most, sometimes don't do what they say. And so Malinowski is the father, is credited as being the father of the research method which we now call participant observation. And we're going to be talking more about participant observation and criticisms, criticisms about participant observation and indeed about ethnographic fieldwork uh, more generally in later lectures. But in this series of lectures, we want to have a really clear understanding about where these research methods came from. So that's all we have today. And we've got more following. The next uh, lecture is going to be following a similar format. And we're going to be re-looking at the legacy of Margaret Mead, who was an American cultural anthropologist, a student of Franz Boas. And we're going to see the way that her methods were challenged by Actually, a New Zealander who worked most of his life in Australia, Derek Freeman. So I hope you enjoyed this and make sure that you click the next video. See you again. Bye-bye for now.